Oh, I do see that. <laughs> is, it, is it recording? Okay. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. I'm Michael Walker with the Data Science Group. Uh, we have a fantastic show for you tonight. Uh, it is May 21st, 2013. We're at the University of Colorado Denver. And uh, on our agenda, uh, I am going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, more data versus complex algorithms. Tom Brantley is going to give a presentation on recommendation engines or anticipatory systems. And John Darkey is going to speak about a cumulative squirrel. I want to uh, let everyone know that we have two new sponsors. Cloudera has agreed to sponsor the Data Science Group, and O'Reilly Media has decided to sponsor the Data Science Group. And uh, I'm really excited. Uh, both of these are really good companies. They're really good people. Uh, and we are going to have some additional resources to do some really neat things. So this is your organization, people, and I would like you to let me know what you want, what speakers you want, what topics you want, any special events that you want, um, and uh, we will now have the resources to do some really fun, interesting things. So please, um, I respectfully request that you think hard about it and give me suggestions about what you want to do. Um, we recently had a financial client who had a problem. They had a problem with their modeling, machine learning, and algorithms. And they hired us to take a look uh, at their models. This is a very successful financial firm. And the last few years, they haven't been so successful. And recently, uh, they've lost quite a bit of money. Uh, so I put a team of data scientists together. And we took a look at their financial models. We took a look at their algorithms. And simply put, we found that their models were flawed. And when we told the uh, bots this, the financial data scientists, they were furious because they had spent so much time and energy building these incredibly complicated financial models. But the leadership of the financial firm and the top traders totally understood what we were saying, because they knew that these models didn't work in their everyday trading. Um, it, you know, so the Quan said, well, why in, you know, for 10 years our models appeared to work and we made a lot of money for I said, well, maybe these models are not totally worthless. Uh, they do help you understand certain aspects uh, in theory, but you really can't use them to make actual trades based upon them. And there's a causality issue. You may have been doing well, the firm may have been making a lot of money, these trades doing really well, uh, because not because of the models, but because the overall market was doing very well or you had some traders who had uh, some intuition about trading currency markets. They're doing a, a global macro trading strategy. Um, so I remembered um, uh, some studies uh, that were done uh, about algorithms and about more data. And I told, they wanted us to go in and build them new financial models and tweak or fix or improve their algorithms. And I took a look at it and I said, you know, we can do that. We can work with you guys and attempt to build better algorithms for trading. But I'm not so sure that that's going to solve your problem. I think we might be better off actually simplifying the algorithms and finding better data and finding more data to put into simple algorithms. And the clients were furious. They said, absolutely not. But the traders and the leader of the firms said, yeah, we understand what you're getting at. Go ahead and do that. And we went ahead and did that, and it worked. Uh, I'll get back to that point uh, in a minute. So more data is better. Well, not always, but in some aspects, more data is better. 
So even if it's less exact for Nessie, um, and this is very difficult to understand because it goes against everything scientists were taught. Scientists were taught that you've got to be very exact in your data, get precise measurements, and be very accurate. But big data, when you have more data, you, you really change it. So let me give you an example. Let's talk about a vineyard. Now, in a vineyard, uh, you can put one sensor, okay, and get a, a temperature or a moisture reading. But that sensor has to be very, very accurate because you're only relying on that one sensor. But what if you put multiple sensors, uh, put a sensor on every vine? Well, it's going to be less accurate. It's going to be messier. It's going to be producing a whole lot more data. But more data points gives you greater value. Ah, well, in the aggregate, it gives you a more comprehensive picture, even though it's messier and it's not as accurate. So here, you would put cheap sensors on every vine. And now a lot of these sensors may break. They, they may not uh, record accurately. But taken together, all of this data is going to give you uh, much uh, better information than just one sensor, even though it's messier, even though it's not as precise. So what if you increase the frequency of the sensor readings? Well, one measure uh, per minute, that's going to be very, very accurate. You're going to be getting accurate data. The old school scientists are going to love this. But what if you do 100 readings per second? What's going to be a whole lot messier? It's going to be out of sequence. Some of it's going to be delayed. Uh, uh, some of it's not. It's a great probability that the data is not going to be as accurate. But you're trading off greater volume, more data, for preciseness. So you have to accept messiness to get at scale. Now, you can't do this for certain hard science disciplines. This type of thinking wouldn't work for life sciences or astrophysics. But the realm of business or public policy, it does work. So what you're doing is you're sacrificing accuracy in return for knowing the general trend. So with big data, you have to start thinking probabilistically. It's, it's Bayesian probability. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, today, the math schools are not teaching our kids about how to think in terms of Bayesian probability. Um, you have to start thinking like a gambler. My, my a good friend is a gambler. He does very well. He's got a great mathematical mind. It's always dealing with odds. And when you're, in, when you're making policy or executing policy, or you're a business person, you need to, you're not going to have perfect information. So you need to start thinking in terms of probabilities. Uh, and that's a very difficult thing for us to get our minds around. But when you're dealing with very large data sets, that's what you, you have to start thinking that way. So this is good, yet this also has many problems. Um, you, and there's the curse of big data, which we'll go over later. Um, and again, if you're doing hard sciences, you know, uh, uh, biometrics, econometrics, um, or if you're dealing with uh, astrophysics or other type of sciences, this kind of thinking won't work. You do need preciseness. You do need to be exact. But the business of public policy, you can do this. So why does this matter? Why do we need to be concerned about how we think about big data? Well, has everybody heard of the Internet of Things? Well, simply put, the Internet of Things is when all organic and inorganic things are wired together, and wired to computers, and wired to humans. Uh, this is one person's timeline of when this is going to happen. I suggest that it's already happening, but in a very primitive form, and that it's, we're going to be putting sensors into more and more things. Um, so we're going to put sensors into your body, we're going to put sensors into the home, into airplanes, and into buildings. 
And what is this going to produce? A ton of data. So if you look at the chart, you can see today most companies maybe use exabytes. Maybe they use zettabytes if they're very, very big. Really, the only ones using Yadabyte today are perhaps the Central Intelligence Agency um, and Life Sciences and Astrophysics. But in maybe five years, this is really scary, we're all going to be dealing with Yadabytes. That's a lot of data, so we're going to have to revamp the entire ETL, Extract, Transfer, Load method of transferring data. We're going to have to Think of new scientific techniques. We're going to have to invent new scientific techniques. We're going to have to create a whole new canon for data science that incorporates things from statistics, from math, from Bayesian probability, and from other disciplines to be able to make sense out of all this data. So what is data science? Well, uh, there are a lot of different definitions, but I'll tell you what our definition is. It means the scientific study of the creation Manipulation and transformation of data to create meaning. So, data science is really an exciting place to be at right now because we get to invent it. We're at the very beginning. We're at the pre-industrial stage. We're inventing this as we go along. I, I think that that's wonderful. What's a data scientist? A data scientist means a professional who uses scientific methods, or indeed, uses scientific methods to liberate and create meaning from raw data. So I think that that's a pretty solid definition of what a data science is. And then big data, what is big data? Basically big data means large data sets that have different properties from small data sets. And you need uh, different type of technology tools to be able to handle the big data. But it also means that you have to use different techniques to separate the signal from the noise. So that's what it's all about. I mean, data scientists are about getting actionable, valuable insights to the consumers, whether they be a business person, whether they be a policy person. You've got to take all this big data, most of it's going to be noise, and you've got to figure out where the signal is. Well, this is incredibly difficult, incredibly difficult, that the curse of big data is that the larger data sets that you're working with, the more statistically significant correlations you're going to find. Most of those correlations are spurious. There's no causation. But the human brain is set up to see patterns. And I think what's going to happen is that a lot of untrained people are going to um, mistake signal for noise by looking at these uh, correlations without causation, thinking there's some sort of important pattern there, and then the decision makers are going to rely on this and they're going to start making bad decisions. So what do data scientists do? Well, we have a whole lot of tools to work with. We have new technology that without we really couldn't do what we're doing today. You've got to know math, statistics, that's a very important part. You've got to have hacking skills, you've got to know machine learning. You gotta know how to design and execute algorithms. Sometimes you need domain expertise. But more and more, data science is a team sport. And what we're doing is we're putting together teams of data scientists. Some people are good at the data engineering. They're good at the plumbing of all the data. Other people are good at getting the insights from the data. Um, one person who is a data scientist cannot have all these expertise. And there may be a few, but they're very, very rare. So as data scientists, you may want to pick just a few different areas where you become very strong and specialize in, but you're going to be working in teams. So what is a signal? A signal means a meaningful interpretation of data based on science, based on science that may be transformed into scientific evidence and knowledge. We're all about separating the signal from the noise. What's noise? Noise is just a competing interpretation that's not based on science. And so you need to be very, very careful. Actually, noise can be very valuable knowing what doesn't work. So data scientists need to separate the signal from the noise. 
and there's technology to do that, and there's certain techniques to do that. We are going to be developing the data science canon and the new techniques in the next five to ten years as the Internet of Things produces all this incredible data. So machine learning, what is machine learning? Machine learning simply means uh, setting up a computer so it has the ability to learn by itself without programming. It's a branch of artificial intelligence. And again, we're in the pre-industrial age of artificial intelligence. Data science will play a very important role in my opinion of uh, developing artificial intelligence by all the experiments that we're doing right now with machine learning. Um, algorithms. Again, we're at the very beginning of our knowledge of algorithms. In fact, I would suggest that we have created a lot of very complicated algorithms that we don't understand, especially in the uh, financial area. Um, they're simple algorithms, they're complex algorithms. Uh, we are going to need to learn to experiment and create new types of algorithms uh, without fully understanding them. Therefore, there's going to be a lot of damage from designing algorithms that we don't really understand. What is an algorithm? It's simply a set of processes or rules that set up to achieve a certain goal. Um, right now in the financial area, there are so many different algorithms that are going through the financial pipes. We don't understand how they're interacting. A number of them are colliding. Uh, it's caused incredible crashes. Uh, I would suggest that there's probably uh, a number of very serious negative side effects uh, that are going to come from these financial algorithms because we really don't understand a lot. So now we're back to more data trumps better algorithms. So let me tell you a little story that I think will help uh, you understand it. Uh, in the late 1990s, Microsoft had uh, a word processor a program called Word. How many of you used that? Yeah, remember the grammar check? It wasn't very good. It was okay, but Microsoft said that they, want, they wanted to improve it, so they put a team together to improve this grammar check. And they were going to do it by improving the algorithms, by using new techniques and new features. But before they decided to try this, they decided to do a little experiment. And so what they did is they fed more data into existing models. The, you know, so most machine learning algorithms use one million words or less. This is a great example of why more data is better. So the experiment, why not use 10 million words, 100 million words, 1 billion words? We're just experimenting. Let's, let's see what happens. Well, guess what? The algorithms improve dramatically the more data you put into them. So this is what blew everybody's mind. The simple algorithm that was the worst before for half a million words, for more better than all others with a billion words. And vice versa, the algorithm that worked best for a half a million words performed worse with one billion words. So, in other words, more data comes less data in this situation, not always, or other contexts where that doesn't ring true, and small data can be beautiful. And more is better, more is smarter. Uh, so, there's a trade-off between spending time developing algorithms and spending it on data development. So in your strategy, uh, the best strategy is to use simple algorithms which as much data as you can get, even if it's messy, even if it's not accurate. This is to improve it over and over again in a number of different experiments. Google! How many of you have used Google Translation? I love that. I remember in the 1990s, our firm did a lot of international work, and we got we had the best translation software on the market. It was awful. It was awful. But Google, in about 2003, decided they wanted to build uh, a language translation 
program that was better than all the rest. So what did they do? They realized the lesson, aha, simple algorithms with more data is better. So they decided they were going to go scrape off the internet everything, all these different sentences. And this is a huge, large, messy data set. They did that for one billion words and up to one trillion words. You know what they found? The same thing. This corroborates what Microsoft did. The more words they put into it, the better the translation software works. So it actually gets better every year. It's not perfect. You know, I use it all the time, but it, it's getting better and better, right? They're feeding it with more and more data, even messy data, even not precise data. So, simple algorithms and lots of data trump complex models. That's what we're finding. Nobody expected to find it. It goes against everything that we learn as scientists, but it's true. So what does this tell us? As data scientists, when we're doing work for a client, they often will ask you to create better, more complex algorithms. And you sometimes, not always, in fact most of the time, need to sit them down and say, maybe you don't need more sophisticated algorithms, maybe you just need very simple algorithms, but you need to spend a whole lot more time on your data development, getting the right type of data along with the simple algorithms. And usually that works. So, in closing, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to use data science to make the world a better place. Thank you. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with what Mike said, actually. Uh, it's interesting. When I was at Strata, uh, I had the opportunity to hear the uh, Chief Data Scientist of Kaggle uh, do a presentation. Well, Kaggle is a big uh, data science competition website. And what he said is that if you look at the people who win their competitions, it's rarely people with the most complicated algorithms. Almost everyone uses the same algorithms. It's usually some combination of uh, random forests and neural networks. But what sets the teams apart, the win is they understand the problem better, they're usually subject better experts, and they're much better at feature extraction. Uh, so it's almost, it's almost certainly on the data side to improve your result than it is on the algorithm side. And I, I agree with that. So my name is Tom Graham. Um, I'm a data scientist at Dish Network on the south side of town. Um, I work in the pure measurement group. So my team ingests all of the viewing data for people watch from set-top boxes. And we use that data for a number of applications. Um, upsell, custom profiling, and what I'm going to talk about this evening, recommendation engines. So I'm sure you're all very familiar with recommendation engines conceptually. Um, you're taking data from a lot of different sources, from a lot of different people. Um, you're taking all that past preference, uh, history, viewing history, buying history, and you're using it to create personalized recommendations on shows, on items, uh, whatever you might want to uh, make a recommendation on. Document searches are essentially just recommendation engines based upon your search terms to try to return the most relevant documents to you. Um, and it's really a fascinating area of research. So very, very brief history. Recommendations have been around since the early 90s. The first really viable recommendation engine that we recognized in this modern form was Rublet in 1992. Rublet was used to search USTEP, which was kind of a distributed forum uh, of opinions. Uh, if you happen to have ever used it, maybe you can uh, offer better definitions than that, but that's my understanding. Uh, Rublet was created by a group of computer scientists at the University of Minnesota. Uh, they use some very simple uh, Kenyers Neighbors algorithms, which we'll actually do some examples talking about. Uh, it's still active today as a research uh, partnership between the University of Minnesota and MIT. They still work on recommendations and technology. And in addition to group links for use, that they also established movie links, which was the first commercially available, uh, first widely available uh, recommendation for movie ratings. And that data set, the movie links is, is still one of the benchmark data sets for uh, doing research on recommendations today. So, 
recommend just kind of kick around, and they were used um, mostly by hobbyists and, and they did some commercial applications, but they really hit the big time around 2000 uh, during the dot com bill because Amazon adopted recommendations as really core of its sales strategy. Um, Amazon, even to this day, doesn't have the most technically sophisticated recommender possible, but what they've been best at is integrating into their business model. Um, estimates of Amazon sales student recommendations is in the area of 20 to 30 percent of their revenue. So it's an extremely important part of their business model. And once other companies saw how much money there was to be made by providing good recommendations to their customers, they just jumped on board. And you see companies now, like Pandora is a good example, Stitch Fix, which is a uh, sends you clothing side of Z uh, every month based upon your preferences that you've given them beforehand. Uh, and Google, because their search engine is essentially a recommendation engine producing documents based upon uh, your search term. All these companies make recommenders a core part of their business. There's not a few ones, there are many others. So what are recommenders do? So like I said, you're essentially taking um, data from lots and lots of people, whether it's ratings on items, shows, uh, words and documents, whatever it may be. Um, and you are using algorithms, machine learning algorithms, to produce personalized recommendations for those individuals, typically using some form of collaborative filtering. So what is collaborative It's kind of the core of recommendations. So the name is very big. It's collaborative because you're taking the preferences of many, many users into account. And it's filtering because you're essentially taking the whole universe of possible items and you're filtering out all the ones that people are disinterested or unlikely to be interested in. And you're only presenting them with the items you're most likely to buy, the shows you're most likely to want to watch, etc. And there are a lot of algorithms for this. Probably the most commonly used ones are variance of cares and neighbors algorithms, where you're trying to find very similar users or very similar items. Um, this is a fairly large family, and two of the most common algorithms are cosine similarity and Pearson correlation. We'll actually walk through a cosine similarity example in just a moment. Um, other uh, techniques which are pretty widely used, Bayesian belief nets. Uh, these range from pretty simple in the case of naive Bayes, where you're allowing no interconnection between uh, the, uh, the predictors. Uh, you only have direct edges to go straight from the predictors to your target of. Uh, to very complicated Bayesian belief nets, where you have a lot of connection between nodes, you have a lot of conditional probabilities between, uh, between your predictors. A uh, little harder to train if you're using a more complicated type but very powerful to train correctly. Markov decision processes, if you're familiar with Markov chains and the idea of, uh, of stochastic systems, um, Markov decision processes are a way of modeling people's future decisions based upon uh, where they are now, not looking a whole lot at what they've done in the past, but looking at uh, how their current choices uh, branch off from what their current state is. And, the Markov, uh, Markov decision process framework allows for some cost optimization where you can look at what the outcome is from a, uh, from a profit perspective from different outcomes and model the process based on that. Also, kind of hard to train. Late semantic indexing methods, huge family matrix factorization techniques that allow you to uh, try to find hidden classes in documents. So, for example, if you see a document that has the words flying, jet, and play in it, it's probably about airline travel. And if you see a lot of documents that have those co that combination of words in it, it's reasonable to assume there's some underlying class that is causing, that is generating, in the, like the algorithm is generating those words, in this case, airline travel. Um, almost all search engines use some form of latent semantic indexing to, uh, to do recommendations. And then association rules working, which may be the, uh, not the oldest, but one of the oldest commercial uh, application of recommendation engines. You think of it as a market asset analysis. So if you buy six, uh, six items at King Supers, and there's a seventh item that people will usually buy with that one, with the six you bought, don't be surprised if in a week you get a coupon for that seventh item. Um, and also don't be surprised if they're placed very close together on store shelves, uh, because grocery stores are very good at this. In fact, most of are very good at figuring out what items are commonly bought, bought, bought together, and that's a form of association. Just a short survey. So what we'll walk through now is a cosine similarity example. So 
Cosine similarity is a very simple collaborative flow theory algorithm that is, I might want to start with, that's a good geometric interpretation. Uh, but it's a way to find similar items or similar individuals. You can do, uh, if you're looking for items that are similar, it's called an item to item collaborative filter. If you're looking for people who are similar, it's a user to user or customer to customer collaborative filter. In this case, we're going to be doing a user to user. So, imagine individual ratings on a set of items as a matrix. So if I have Tom, I would ask for Tom, Bob, and Dave, and we have Doug and Sports. You can model uh, my preferences, say, let's say I give Doug a 2, and Sports a 5, say Bob gives Sports a 3, I mean Doug a 3, and Sports a 1, not a big sports fan, Dave loves Doug, and he doesn't do You can model um, these preferences as a matrix and each uh, set of ratings as a vector. And you can either say that the vector of Tom's preferences or the vector of ratings on the uh, In my case, I'm going to use the vector of Tom's preferences. The way you figure out the similarity of these vectors is you calculate the cosine of the angle between. So, in this example, if we have gum as a dimension and we have sports as a dimension, you can say Tom really likes gum, not a big sports fan. So Tom is there. Or rather, Tom's there. And you can say that Dave likes sports. He's he's hit me on the It's not a thing. So this is it. If you calculate the cosine of this angle, the closer it is to one, the closer these vectors are together, the more similar uh, these two individuals are. So here's a little more extended example, but similar idea. If you have Bob and Robin, and these are their preferences on television shows. And you have to introduce a new user, James, who hasn't seen the wired movies. You see the other five, but not those two. And you want to figure out, well, who do I recommend to James? Do I recommend the wire or do I recommend the movies? What you can do is you can take the five shows that they all have in common, and you can figure out how similar James is. The vector of his ratings is to the vector of each of the other individuals. In this case, it's going to be five-dimensional, so it's not so easy to draw. You can draw that showing out. Um, and when you do the calculation, what you find is that these are the cosine similarities, and that Mary has the highest similarity. Actually, plenty of times is very close. They're back there, pretty closely aligned. So since Mary is closest to James in terms of show ratings, let's see what she like better. Twin Peaks, very slender, but not a big fan of either. So we would make the recommendation to James that it's probably more likely like Twin Peaks, but maybe we don't put a lot of weight on that because Mary wasn't a big fan. So this seems like a very simple technique, and mathematically it is, um, but it's extremely robust, especially uh, when you do it by the eye. And that's Amazon does a, a variant of this for I buy collaborative filtering. Um, that's why they produce a lot of their recommendations. It's nice for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of the big ones being that it's very, very fast. So, something we encounter very often in recommendation in the literature is that there's not a lot of debate over which algorithms to use. There's a, people use a number of different ones, but for any given purpose, there's a few that probably work best and it's pretty well known. Where most of the research is on making things very fast and on figuring out how to run these algorithms on enormous data sets. So, a good example is the Netflix challenge. Uh, the Netflix challenge was a challenge that Netflix offered a million dollars to anybody who could improve their recommendation by 10%. And they released a data set, which at the time was the largest broadly available uh, data set for recommendation training in the world. It was a little over a million movies on right around 500,000 users. So that is an enormous matrix. Just an enormous matrix. So how do you write algorithms that allow you to crunch all that data and do it fast manner, do it in such a way that you can tweak the algorithm and change them and keep running this and not have to run the program for three days every time you make a small change. 
Uh, the ability to learn very quickly is a huge And cosine similarity is good because you can extend it to very, very large data sets. It's not terribly complicated, not terribly mathematically uh, demanding on the machine to figure it out. And I have five similarities I mentioned. Very much the same. Um, Amazon uses it very So let's take the more corporate standpoint because you know, I am a large corporation, so I have to think in terms of ROI to a certain extent. Uh, the cosine similarity algorithm is good, but it doesn't tell you anything about the value of that recommendation to you as a recommender. Um, so it doesn't tell you anything about the value of that recommendation to you as a firm. So if you want to add margin into the recommendation decision, figure out what is going to give you the highest expected cost. What you need is an algorithm that outputs a probability. Um, now, there are a number of algorithms that do this. You can do this with multinomial logistic regression. You can do this with certain forms of neural networks. But a very common one, it's pretty cool to train, is uh, naive phase. Um, is anyone familiar with naive phase? I'm going to do I'm sure it's very, very familiar. <laughs> um, so, basically, the theorem tells us the probability of our beliefs being true given prior release evidence. Now, just in case anybody is unfamiliar with the theorem, This is it. The probability of A to B is, or the posterior is equal to the probability of T to A times the probability of A divided by the probability of B. Uh, where you can also read that the posterior is equal to the likelihood times the prior divided by the evidence. Nine phase is a class of that utilizes this theorem with a set of simplifying assumptions to generate probability uh, that answers belonging to a specific class. And once you have that class of probability, you can combine that with our expected payoff to figure out what the problem of recommendation is. So how does it generate class probabilities and, and how can we mesh that with payoffs to get, uh, to get to our recommendation? Let's say we have two products and we want to figure out which one we're going to do. So pretty, pretty small example. Different amount of profit to the firm for each of the products and we know uh, the cash purchasing behavior of a bunch of people, uh, one of whom has not bought the firm. And as always, we'll represent our knowledge as a series of matrices and vectors. So here's our purchase history. So you've got 12 people, Don through Regina, who have bought a toy, a game, a piece of candy, a book, and a boat of some sort. And we want to figure out what boat should we recommend to Aaron. Well, Matty Phase is going to take the independent probabilities of these events to generate class probabilities. So, Using Bayes' theorem, what we want to get to is the probability of A given B. In this case, you can read that as the probability of both given by it. So, what is the, uh, the probability of both, uh, of both given the items? So, which both specifically, speedboat or sale? Well, it's going to be equal to the probability of the items given a boat <coughs> times the probability of a uh, given kind of boat divided by the evidence. Now, for the purposes of naive Bayes, because we're not really interested in the absolute probability, we're just interested in the probabilities in proportion to one another of the speedboat versus the sailboat, we're not going to worry about the evidence, the probability of, of B in this case. Because it's just a scale factor, we don't need it for this purpose. So let's talk about our primary assumption. So, the big thing we have to calculate, and it's kind of hard, is the probability of this vector of items given the boat. But we make a simplified assumption. We assume that the probability of you make a big superfactor. It's a big and, and big superfactor. Superfactor. assumption. There's no, there's no conditional relationship. That's exactly the way the items. That's exactly the assumption you make. You assume that because somebody bought a Snickers bar, that has no effect on whether or not they like Harry Potter. If you go, if you go back, there's all these events are independent for the purposes of naive things, and it is a big simplifying assumption. Um, 
If you wanted to make a much more complicated Bayesian belief set, you could relax that assumption. It becomes much more computationally difficult. And while it will give you some better results, empirically, value based performs fairly well, even with the simplifying assumption, especially if you use it on, on large data sets. And the simplifying assumption that the events are independent allows us to say that the probability of the item set given the mode is equal to the product of each individual item given the probability of the mode. So those probabilities are not necessarily independent. If they're not independent, then this doesn't hold. Uh, but we are going to make that a simplifying assumption for the purposes of calculating uh, output. So let's look at our probabilities and calculate. So if you look at the probability of each vote, um, half the people want to say well, half the people want to say vote. So that's the same. And then you can see for each uh, the people who want to say well, three bought a Sorka, one bought a Kai, two bought a ball, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So when we want to figure out what we should recommend error, we need to calculate the probability of the items given the vote times the probability of the vote for both types of them. And the way we do that is because we know that uh, we can calculate the probability of the items given theta as simply the probability of each item given theta. We just multiply all the way across. And what you see is that with the vote, and remember this is without the scaling constant, with the vote you have a probability of 0 0.00086 for the sample vote and 0 0.000048 for the speed vote. And like I said, these are very low, but we left up the scale constant because it doesn't matter what the real probabilities are. It only matters what the probabilities are in proportion to one another. You know, the only big issue, and I agree with you in my days, it's nice, but some of Michael's, I, I would say, overblown generalizations at the front end um, about new data, if you have a highly correlated two variables together and you have a lot of, um, uh, a lot of collinearity in some of your data, it's going to lead you, it can lead you pretty much astray, which suggests that you really do need to know a lot about the subject matter you're dealing with, um, and just having more data, in that case, in a highly collinear situation, is not good. In fact, it will lead you, it will lead you very much astray. You can. And, and Mark makes an excellent point, and, you know, I don't want to derail the data for too much, but what it's a good case for is feature attraction and understanding the input of your data that is isn't highly collinear. <coughs> you know, if you are doing data preparation, you find collinearity is always something you can test for. And if you find it, you need to figure out which one of those variables you need to drop. Yeah. Because one of them, I think you can vote. But more data, 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 data in that situation is not better. That has to be It's worse. It will hinder your analysis. More, more of the right data. It's absolutely, but the right data means you understand the question. It is what it is. So, continue example. So, it, it seems like a simple explanation, right? If you look at just the probabilities, it's hard to do the math uh, because they're so small, but what you find is that 18 times more likely that error can find the sale will perform recommendations than they will see from it. But let's say that our loader is going to be a really, really high margin. I make 20 bucks um, off every speedboat I sell. And sale was really expensive to produce, so I only have luck off of each one. In this case, if there's an 18 person, if he's 18 times as likely to buy the speed boat, but I make 20 times as much, I mean, I'm sorry, if he's 18 times as likely to buy the sale boat, but I make 20 times as much off the speed boat, I should still recommend him the speed boat. Because even though the probability of him buying is much lower, my expected payoff is about 11% higher just because my margin is greater than the difference in probability. And this is a calculation that's used by firms all the time to figure out what is the right product to recommend. It's not always the one that somebody's most willing to buy. In many cases, the most likely product is one that is probably inexpensive. It's something that they're not going to make a lot of money off of. It's something that they might buy anyway, even if you didn't recommend it. There's a lot of things to consider when making a recommendation, and it's not as simple as what is the best match. You also have to take things like ROI into consideration when making recommendations and designing commercial recommendations. So let's talk about issues. So the algorithms for recommenders are generally not that complex as machine learning goes, as I mentioned, I think, earlier. Um, you don't see a lot of uh, deep learning neural networks. 
Um, you don't see a lot of support vector machines because these are very computationally expensive algorithms to utilize on very large data sets. Um, so most of the research is not around the algorithm so much as it is around problems like these. So these are the three big ones. Cold start, data sparsity, and uh, all color sheet. So the cold start problem, how do you make recommendations for somebody who is not in your system before? That's not me. Data sparsity, Netflix data set, like I said, a million rows, a million movies, about 500,000 users. 98.6% of that matrix is zeros. Because how many movies can one person see, right? Not, not that many, certainly not a million. Uh, so how do you deal with that kind of data sparseness? Uh, it blows up a lot of algorithms. And then the gray and black, gray and black sheet problem. Some people have really good days. And it's very, very hard to predict what we're going to uh, recommend to them because if you're basing a recommendation off of different people and you're assuming they're relatively homogenous so you have somebody who comes in with a very odd taste, it's hard to find the right thing. So we'll discuss each of these in turn. So dealing with cold start. Cold start's probably the easiest thing to deal with because it's really only a problem at the very beginning of a customer's recommend, uh, interaction with a recommender. Um, Requiring creation for profile is very common. You know, if I know that you're a man and you're age 35 and you're married, that tells me a fair amount about you, but not to at least get started on recommendations. Uh, or if you're a service like Pandora, which makes all its recommendations based upon uh, the music that you've chosen to listen to, that first station you hit that you want to make, if you want to make a jazz station, that tells me a lot about you and your taste already. It tells me probably like you don't necessarily need vocals in your music, you like improvisation, you might have chord changes, etc. And I can build off that pretty easily. What you also find too, what a lot of sites will do, is they will start off with an item by item to item recommender, period. So whatever your first item is you buy, they won't try to deduce too much about you from that, but they'll try to find a similar item and recommend it to you. Because even if you only bought that one thing, chances are a lot of other people bought that item. And they bought a lot of other items that they've also created, and they can make an item, item raise. And as you become more active with the site and it gets to know you better, you can gradually shift the mix of an item to item recommend into more personalized recommendations. Um, so that's a very common uh, way of handling the cold start issue. So that one has been largely mitigated. Data sparse is a big issue. There's really two ways you can deal with this. You can either try to keep the data, or you can you, you can try to reduce the dimensions of the data. Imputation is really what people try first. Uh, you're typically using something like cosine similarity to try and figure out who's, who's similar to you. Anything you have rated, you would use the average of uh, people who are similar to you, whatever their rating was on it. And you would basically fill in the sparse matrix and make it very dense. A couple of problems, though. It doesn't make the matrix any smaller. In fact, it makes it harder to deal with because, well, it makes it more computation expensive to deal with because now it's of a bunch of zeros. You've got this incredibly dense matrix. And the other thing is, if you're dealing with a system like Netflix where there's a million movies and somebody's rating maybe 40, 50 at the upper end, you're making up, essentially making up, almost all your data. So that's a very dangerous way to try and Great recommendations. One more data is better. One more data is better. So, where the action is now, and this is probably the most intensive research area of recommendation engines, is in latent factor methods, which typically are based upon matrix factorization. Uh, so, what you're doing is you're taking these huge matrices, you're decomposing them, and you're trying to reduce the rank and create a low rank. Not equivalent, but a very similar matrix. And it's usually based on some form of singular value constant, for those of you who have uh, had some layer algebra. Um, I won't go into it too much because, uh, believe me, matrix factorization techniques could be a variety of our courses. It's a big subject. But essentially, what you're doing is you're trying to find the orthogonal components of the data that capture the most variance within the matrix and include only those components in a matrix of reduced array, which you actually use to run your algorithms. Um, like I said, I don't want to go into this to a great deal uh, because it is a very technically complex subject. 
but if you're interested, look up principal components analysis and CO and IUD composition. It's a fascinating area of research and it has applications far beyond uh, recommendation engines in areas like physics and signal processing. It's, it's a fascinating area. So the last one, deal with sheep of varying arguments, right? Black sheep. So to a large extent, there's nothing you can do about this. Some people will have funky taste, and it will be very, very hard to find recommendations for them. Ways you can mitigate to a certain extent. Um, if you have user feedback on items, be an important part of your recommending uh, your recommender system. If you have the number of recommended items that people actually purchase, uh, be a part of your recommend recommender system, part of the tuning. You can gradually figure out some of these idiosyncratic things, but if a person's weird enough, you're probably never going to get a great recommendation for them, unfortunately. It's simply very difficult. Uh, great collection for double troubles because not only is it hard for you to make recommendations to them, but their odd or reflective taste can also skew your recommendation to a certain extent. Because remember, you're building this based upon the purpose behavior or new behavior or whatever behavior of your users. And if your users are all over the place and very inconsistent and don't match one another well, it's going to be very hard to build an algorithm based upon their behavior. So don't everyone, wouldn't every once in a while you do some sort of outlier analysis and just throw those people out of your, uh, you could, out of your analysis and you could. I mean, that would be too hard even, even amongst your uh, even you're using a cosine method, you yeah. could just look at it and say, these people are off in left field, I'm going to drop them. You, you can. The, the difficulty with it is that people aren't always consistently easy or hard to deal with, and it's hard to know where the cutoff is. Yes, you can do that. Um, but there are rules of thumb for that sort of thing. Yes, there are heuristics. Um, you can exclude people. Um, I'm not talking about excluding just not serving, just saying excluding them so they don't work your overall you, you, you model. Can. And especially if you have a, a system that has a large number of users, you have the luxury of being able to get rid of data points uh, for the generation of the engine, you, you can't do that. That's absolutely true. Um, it's more of a problem if you have a smaller uh, data set, if you have a large proportion of people who are gray or black sheep, then it becomes harder to distinguish between the two. So imagine if you were trying to recommend fashion. Uh, people might have very similar taste in books and video games, but some kind of fashion, you might have a large percentage of people who are idiosyncratic in their taste, and then it becomes very hard to build a generalized recommendation simply because you don't necessarily have a consensus on ratings within your population. So uh, it can be a good definition. So with that, uh, I'll wrap it up. Uh, this is a topic that is of great interest to me, both from a practical standpoint and a theoretical standpoint. Um, if you're interested in dipping a toe in a machine learning too, it's also a really good one because it's a topic of no popular interest. There's a lot of non-technical or semi-technical articles written about recommenders. A couple of them are up here. Um, the bottom one on the Amazon recommendation engine. Uh, and the uh, next one up on the well course solution of the Netflix challenge are both accessible to anybody who uh, has a decent math background. If you really want to get into matrix factorization, that's a really good article to start with, um, though you will end up digging through the references extensively if you really want to understand it. It's a, it's a complex topic. And if you just want a good general overview, um, the top one is an excellent survey of collaborative filtering techniques that goes into a little more depth um, than I have but over a pretty broad range of, uh, of techniques. So with that, uh, thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions? How much machine learning do you use? Well, I mean, it's essentially all machine learning. Uh, I mean, uh, naive days, cosine similarity, these are not complex instances of machine learning, uh, particularly, but they are instances. So it's set up to do a continuous improvement. You can set it up like that. Uh, the typical model for recommenders is offline learning. With um, issuing updates, you know, every every day, every week, every month, just depending upon how often you got your data decayed and it's used decay. Uh, but it's typically you learn it offline, and then you push recommendations in real time. Yeah, that, that was very common among among direct marketers. That's what we yeah. used to do. 
which was calibrate the system periodically offline, and then that made it a lot easier when someone got on the phone. Yeah. Uh, when you had an outbound or inbound calling center that you they called up, your model was calibrated, and it was very, very straightforward. Um, and that is our model as well. I mean, Dish Network, we do a great deal of direct marketing, so that's mostly what we're using this in context for. We're working on getting a recommender on the NS and top boxes, but it's a, it's a, it's a challenge. Um, an interesting structure, too, is the structure Netflix uses. Netflix actually does a great deal of offline learning, but then they have uh, they have an online component that's very shallow in terms of the actual learning it'll do, but it will adjust a little bit on the fly based upon people's clicks on the site as they go through and select movies and as a uh, turn down to some recommendations. But the bulk of it is, is offline, so they'll have a they'll have a mix. Um, it's it's a very good model, it's a very strong model. Netflix is really a great place to look if you want to learn how to roll recommendations out in a profitable way. Um, as company. That would pull right into a Bayesian model in which you have your, uh, your, your, you have your, your knowledge, your priors as the offline information, and then your data uh, observations that are coming in as the, as the uh, sampling results and being able to adjust it. Absolutely. That would, yeah. That would be, that would be uh, yeah. No, I think the Bayesian approach is, uh, like much of machine learning, I mean, I think the Bayesian approach is, is often the right one. Uh, in this case, because you essentially are updating your knowledge first. Uh, and you have very informative priors because you typically have a long personal right. history. Okay. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, but don't you want as much data as possible on each individual? I think that conceptually you do. Uh, you know, the difficulty in very large amounts of data is how do you sift through it and how do you extract the features. I think if you have the ability to develop a good methodology of uh, a good methodology for separating the wheat from the chaff in a very fast, efficient way, uh, so that you're not spending all of your time on data preparation, uh, you do want more data. You know, it's like I like I said, Mark, you always want more quality data, right? You always want more quality data. But if you have too much of the deluge of data, it can be very hard to distinguish what makes sense versus what doesn't. Now, certainly, you as the subject matter expert can say whether or not this data point is likely to be useful versus this other data point, which is probably spurious and maybe we shouldn't even worry about it. Uh, but in, in terms of quality data, you know, data about user preferences, about purchase behavior, demographics, it's almost always useful to have in those cases. But it also has also a lot of these data have a shelf life. And That's you true. just having more data at a longer history, in some cases, just you have to assume that you have a stationary overall your process is stationary, but in many cases it's not. And you have to you have to cut off at a particular point and having just a long time frame um, is not necessarily good, which I suspect may be the issue you were dealing with in the financial community, which is models lose their juice over time. All models do. It doesn't really matter. And you, that just says the latency of the model. Um, you have to be recalibrating all of the time, which you're doing in this case. Yes, couldn't agree more. <clears throat> okay, when you go to Google search and you start typing in, sometimes it finishes yeah. in your sentence before. How does that work? Well, uh, Google has a pretty good idea of what people type since uh, they have a history of everybody's searches. Uh, I don't know what the algorithms that they use. Uh, my guess would be that they're just figuring out what has the highest probability based upon all of their users and also your own past behavior to be the finish of that one. And also things are trending. And I'm sure well, that's, 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 that's a I mean. huge advantage of the trending uh, situation, meaning what's hot right now. I mean, I'm sure that if you tried to type in Oklahoma, you would get tornado right now very rapidly. Yeah, and it's, I, I imagine it's a balance between you as an individual. Uh, you know, I look at a lot of machine learning topics. So if I start typing in singular, it will probably finish with value decomposition. Certainly if I get the singular space B, it will, it will pop up value decomposition uh, as the rest of it. Whereas for another user, that would probably be at like if you were a physics user and you type in singular, I'm finished with ITY because you're researching black holes. Who knows? Yeah. 
But what's interesting is my friends at Google tell me that they're actually moving away from models and uh, algorithms and including more human beings and doing a lot more experimentation. You see both sides of it. Uh, Pandora is a very interesting example of this. So Pandora uh, is an and they're making recommendations about songs. The way Pandora works is they have a little, I think it's still a little less than a million songs per database. And they literally have a big office full of music analysts sitting around. And when a new song comes in and they want to add it to their library, they have somebody listen to it and grade it on a variety of dimensions, on the tempo, on the style, on the instrumentation, etc. They have added it to absolutely use their KNR papers algorithm to recommend songs. So they're absolutely integrating human knowledge in a very direct way. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me if Google did too. It kind of gets back to the data question. Who has more data than Google? I mean, outside of government agencies, probably almost nobody. So and when you're dealing with that big of a volume of data, it becomes increasingly hard, I think, to use automatic methods to alone to deal with it. You have to employ feature extraction. And it's there are automated methods that can help you with feature extraction. Certainly, as I mentioned, matrix factorization is going to assist you with that. But in many cases, it comes down to the human intuition and knowing what is likely to be relevant in a given scenario. Um, I would be very curious to know how, how Google is moving in that direction. Um, I'm sure when they've been doing it for three years, they're releasing record the paper. <laughs> but I think you're right. Feature extraction is key. And what feature extraction requires is that you understand your problem before yeah. you move in, and which is really important in all the ETL conversations, that you need to know what you're ETLing for. If you don't do that, you're, you're totally lost. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the divide between the, uh, the system side and the data management side and the, the modeling side is just, it's just a road. It's such a fast pace. Um, you know, I, I myself am very much in the algorithmic statistics on that side, but I, I'm just scrambling to learn everything I can about big data from an IT side because it has such an impact on the way I do my job and what is available to me as an analyst, um, and even understanding the quality of the data, uh, speed of the data. So, uh, you know, I think those lines are, are blurring. It's a tall task to be well equipped from a skill standpoint in all of the areas, but I, I think it's almost necessary. Ed Dish, do you have a, um, a rating system for rating one, the quality of data, and two, the shelf life of data? We do not. No. Um, we are working on that in terms of our peer measurement data. We certainly have heuristics that we go by. You know, if something's over a year old, it probably doesn't have a lot of relevance. Uh, and you can see that when you run the models and see what kind of you can kind of say with the models, you don't get a lot of significance on your own data. It's, it's not as useful. Um, you know, so much of our data is operational uh, that we store it because we may need it for transaction uh, history purposes to go look stuff up. Uh, I think in terms of social media data, viewing data, things that really do have shelf life, um, we're in the early stages of really utilizing those data streams in a meaningful way, so a lot of those conversations haven't, uh, haven't happened, at least not in a global way. Um, but I think there's definitely a, a recognition that there is a okay the value of, of most of those data streams, uh, you know, anything we're not contractually allocated to keep. And that uh, I, I think we'll have those conversations in a more formal way in the future. I think it's like the weather. Exactly like weather data. I mean, you. Weather data, unless you're a climatological yeah. person, has what two days shelf life? Well, climate data and weather data are very different things. Right, I agree. Yeah. So climate, you know, yeah. climate is the expected value of weather. Yeah. So um, you know, your weather, if you're just a, if you're a company that's just selling weather data, your shelf life yeah. is, is short. Absolutely, financial data. How long is financial data released? Um, six months to twelve months, maybe. maybe. It depends on how you calibrate your models, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. It's not very long. I don't want to eat any more, John. It's time to take it off. Will everyone?
My name is John Gordy. I'm the Stevie Love of Squirrel. Hopefully, give a little bit of a, an explanation. Definitely shift gears down from being uh, modeling and playing base zeros. So, uh, what is a Stevie Love or a Squirrel? Which kind of SQL solution do you want? We've all seen uh, uh, decision trees, but this is a simplified decision tree. Um, no matter where you're going, uh, if you're dealing with smaller databases that have extreme JSON document support needed, um, it'll fit the bill. It'll do what you need to do. The differentiation is security, which I'm going to be defining very, very well, hopefully, over the coming slides. But uh, there are a lot of places to fit this solution to scroll one to We have an HDFS as the foundation of the file system, and almost any type of add-on and augmentation to a cumulo is the same as what we can done MapReduce and Fiji. So what is Squirrel? Squirrel is based on the cumulo. It's a proven, secure, multi-tenant data platform for building real-time applications. So this, and it is an augmentation that we think about. There's a, there's a reason why I'm differentiating it so much, and that is that Camilo is an open source project, with lots of documentation, and we can see what it is and what it does. And Swirl has some secret sauce to deal with egress and ingress and application interfaces. So it scales elastically to tens of kilobytes of data, enables organizations to eliminate their internal data silos. So if you have compliance and security policy issues, then your data is already siloed. You have uh, accounting and finance that access their data, the marketing and research that access theirs, engineering and development that access, access it there. There's not a lot of interchange or, or cross, uh, cross data sharing. So it's seamless integration with the view from most experience. You can make it work with what you've got already. And providing a supply for machine security demands, built from the ground up security. No piecemeal column family stuff from nations. And it's already deployed in and utilized by defense and government agencies. So this is developed from the ground up with NSA and CIA in mind. So a brief history of Squirrel. Uh, Google, of course, publishes their paper. Then the NSA begins development in 2008. In 2011, it's open source. And 2012, it goes from incubation to top level project for Apache. So it's out of the first phases and into the final races. So Squirrel is founded in 2012 after the top level uh, the Google project is, is maintained. And they have a product name in mind that you can download and use inside Amazon's web interface, but the product is uh, proprietary at this point for them. So, moving on, uh, what is Squirrel's architecture? Well, this is an overview, and we'll be breaking this apart quite a bit as we go through. <laughs> we have apps that are, of course, on the, the topmost abstraction, built on top of Squirrel layers, and of course, the core is a cumulon. So ingest and JSON objects and all these things are accommodated uh, through Squirrel's integration and aggregation of all these technologies. What is Accumulo? Accumulo development began at NASA in the NSA in 2008. Uh, it's the base foundation for Squirrel. The cell level security reduces the cost of that both development, certain navigating complex, sometimes impossible legal or policy restrictions. So if you're going to comply and you have a cloud-based app, you're not really sharing. Anybody that has login access to that is well, <laughs> the only ones that login access to that. Yeah. Provides the ability to scale greater than gigabyte levels, so maintaining that same obviously squirrel perspective of getting into the scalability. And it's highly adaptive schema and sort of debugging paradigm that allows for basically a creation of security subsets of sets that is unparalleled. Uh, it's the only solution out there that, that does what this does. And it stores those key value pairs in parts stored in secure controls. So label tokens, uh, ingest labels, all those things are tantamount to cumulative success. So where does the cumulative fit inside Squirrel's platform? It's the core, the keystone, 
it's the, the what time it's not going to work and you couldn't get fast real time access. And we'll come back to that graphic in a bit. So, how does the key mode provide security? First, security labels are by keys on ingest. So, this is very important for data model design. We want to make sure that your, your key, your five tuple key, is, is designed well. We'll get into that as well. So, security is implemented to allow for security policy enforcement using data labeler tags. So, the label tokens are how the security is defined, and that's done in a tertiary uh, solution. Now, that radius any number of, of security type of the points. These policies are applied when data is ingested. So this is done the minute the data is entered into the database. So if you push data to a cumulo, it starts parsing, indexing, and applying the points. Tablets contain data that are controlled using security policies. So tables are built after ingest and then parsed to tablets. We're going to go that more later. And it stores key value pairs and parts of sort of secure controls a five people key system. So five different parts of the key. And this is this kind of sound like a base, but it's not. These are individual keys that are static. You, you cannot append families or insert columns or anything like that. So and, and that'll come up here in a few minutes. So if you know security continue, why so level security is important? So it, we I don't think that we did in the data science community have really focused on security in such a way that makes it approachable and pragmatic. It's always defined by tertiary applications that are outside of ETL. So the, this big old long paragraph is basically saying that we are stifled by the ability to break down data silos, that we have problems disseminating data from flattened HAFS or big data perspectives. And that we still rely on RDBMSs and silent ID to push that data out and make it accessible. So, let's, uh, how does the PLO accomplish this? Well, it's a five tuple key system. This is an example of its design. Notice how unimportant the values are. So, uh, the row controls off the added key. That's uh, the most unique identifier. It's going to be the the data that is indexed. And, and that's going to become important and paramount to data model design in a few minutes. The column then controls locality. The qualifier controls uniqueness, so just another extension of amnesty, but I was for a little subset or subcategory. The visibility label controls access, so this is the security descriptor. This can be an and or with a few subset security measures. And the timestamp, which controls versioning. Uh, nothing is overwritten, which is an HDFS perspective. You have a append only. There are no inserts. There are no postfix commands beside the things. And now these are just fire rates. They can be anything you want. It can be a JSON object. You can parse values inside them. You can do whatever you want with it. So, keys are sorted. How are they sorted? So, it starts from uh, left to right. Oh wow, that's got to be better. Huh? Uh, starts from left to right, uh, row first, column family, column qualifier, and so on. And then that's it graphically, compared to the first byte and the second byte. So it does a standard sort. If you were to do ASCII text, you'd see a, a descending uh, alphabetized list. So, continuing with the security, how does this kind of pan out? Uh, this is an example of column usage. So, in this circumstance, we have the name that is being sorted. And then we have the column family, so this is the type of data the, the row is actually contained with the value. The qualifier is uh, the extension or explains the, the atomicity of the qualifier. Um, and then the visibility is the security permissions. And this is interesting because the, so you just say John Doe, you have to be either John Doe or his psychiatrist to access this data. And so it's an and or with nested parentheses basis. So you can set that syntax so that only uh, uh, John Doe can access it if uh, if he is uh, has both labels of uh, John Doe and the uh, well, I guess psychiatrist is a PCP sample. Um, drug user. Uh, 
<laughs> so so that, that's how data is disseminated and used through security. And this, this is not a part of squirrel or a community that has to be designed and integrated with the existing security layers. So, moving on to the architecture, the Hugo servers tablets, which are what they're called, and we'll see that in just a second, utilize a multitude of big data technologies, but their layout is different than MapReduce alone, HDFS alone, or MongoDB to Sandra alone. Uh, this, the, the behaviors and properties of the Hilo and subsequently Squirrel are similar, but not explicitly implicit. So, data is stored in HDFS. Zookeeper is utilized for configuration management. SSH passwordless node configuration is required in order to deploy, much like uh, many other clusters. An emphasis more of an imperative on data model design and data model itself. And without this uh, thought and approach to data, you can get, <laughs> it won't make any sense. Uh, if your sorts aren't properly sorted on index, then when you use seats, you're not going to get binary searches. You're going to get a binary search after binary search after binary search. So if it doesn't get it on the first byte, it's going to go to the second byte, and so on and so on. You're going to get speed problems. Data model is paramount in the uh, it's, it's pretty important in a lot of other big data solutions, but it, it is not nearly as important as it is in the So the architecture. This is a table. So when we take the table with row, column, column, qualifier, regular, what happens at ingest is it is uh, sorted and partitioned. The partitions are then looked at uh, as tablets. The master server then assigns those tablets to the tablet servers. So that's the, the order of operations that it goes down and why the existence of real time capability is in a because of this first step. And it's something that HBase does, Sandra does, but they do it a little bit differently. So tablets is yes, partition tables like uh, And it's held and managed by tablet servers and controlled by a master server. So here is the tablet server uh, configuration in the entire architecture. So this is how the communication occurs between systems, Zookeeper and HDFS. We have the uh, receive writes and response, uh, response to reads are done on the Chrome clients of the tablet server. So it, it handles all of the application interaction in the API. And the request to a write ahead log. So that sorts new key value pairs in memory will periodically flushing sorted key value pairs to new files in HDFS. So write ahead logs are really important. They allow the tablet servers to kind of stay ahead of the data. And if something goes wrong with the tablet server, the master server is able to look at write ahead logs and recreate that tablet server on the fly. Uh, so it's extremely high redundancy. I was told that this is not eventually consistent, this is highly consistent. That would fall uh, well, on the here. So if uh, any of the data is not parsed or available, then there will be a halt until it is. It's another reason why Zookeeper is so important. So managed by master, and the master is responsible for detecting and responding to tablet server failure and load balancing tablets across tablet servers. And uh, it also coordinates startup, trace, and shutdown and recovery of write ahead logs. So if there is ever a failure, the write ahead logs are read and the tablet servers recreated. Zookeeper manages what you think they do. Uh, it's an Apache project from open source to make it utilized for distributed locking mechanisms and to allow for no single point of failure. You can actually have your master server go down and all your tablets will run, but if the tablet server fails, the right of the log will be read again and everything will come to a halt. So that's another reason to, to keep things going with Zookeeper. So integration with users and access. There will be visibility labels for uh, uh, information labels. Security labels uh, are a feature that is unique to a Hilo. No one else does this from the ground up or ingest. No other database can apply the access controls in such a granular, at such a granular level. Uh, this is an example of how access is provided from application or user to the Squirrel Hilo interface. Labels are generated by translating an organization's existing data security and information sharing policies into Boolean operators. 
So this is basically an example of where you take those JD, those different elements, and you have those apply or created from all that radius security groups, however you can have that in interface. So first, you gather information, an organization's information on security policies, and you dissect them into data-centric and user-centric components so that you have access for whom for what. You then ingest the data, and as you ingest the data labeler tags all of the individual rows and uh, okay. values with those keys and data tokens, data labeler tags. And that gives the appropriate, appropriate visibility for those objects. And then data is then stored in the middle where it's available for real time uh, requests and queries from operational applications. So that's, that's how it gets to the point of index, so that you have everything invested in this. It's very, very quick to both invest and index. And then finally, when the end user performs an operation that is checked and validated against the security descriptors in order to dominate whether or not they have access to that data. So making scroll work on top of a cumulo. Scroll's extensibility of cumulo allows it to process millions of records per second. This is out of the box. Native, you don't have to do any crazy HBase interaction, any ETLs, RWSs, any weird kind of 2.0 stuff. This is from the shell, you get results. These records are converted into hierarchical JSON documents and given document store capabilities. This is an aspect of Squirrel. So they look at the data and it's ingested and they apply a JSON qualifier to it. Passing this data to the analytics layer is going to make integration and development of real time applications accessible. So people can actually look at the Squirrel API. You can sit down using Drift and design Ruby. Perl, Python, whatever you want. And you can make it work. Combining the aspects of the cell level of the QE Squirrel integrates identity and access management systems. So Squirrel is trying to kind of take away that complex application of security descriptors and labels because that's, that's actually one of the major hurdles that people have in deploying software. You, it's how you, what are we even using for security? What are our users even have as that within the access management system? And so that's, Squirrel also takes care of that. They have consultant agency and then the department deals with that. Uh, so the Squirrel process, this is that graphic that I brought up before with the cumulo as a keystone. First data ingest occurs. So we have data going in. It's being JSON or graph, depending upon they have a few different approaches for ingest. And it also comes back, uh, we'll get into the scene as well. So data is ingested, it's parsed, it's indexed, it's given security descriptors. It hits a cumulo, it gets parsed and sorted into tablets, into tablet servers. HDFS is then used to write write in logs and deal with many tables. And then thrift is another aspect to the squirrel layer, and then enables development in diverse language sets and choices. So the, the last section is basically the scene, which allows for analytic integration. Uh, this is another open source project from Apache. Uh, this, this gives graph analysis, uh, full text search, graph search, things like that come with the scene. And then, who is world for? So, what, who needs the accommodating features of security? and cell-based cell perspectives. Uh, CTOs and CIOs, unlock your value and fracture data sets, break down the silos. There's no need to have partitioned data. You can put it all in one location, farm it out, and it out to whomever deserves it. Uh, developers, you can more easily create applications. You don't have to learn a really weird esoteric flavor of Java to get after these jobs to run. Uh, you can, you know, Relying on libraries that you've used before. Infrastructure managers, simplified administration, big data for highly scalable multi tenant distributed systems. So that you can develop different layers of the QL, different deployments, you have different areas of the country or different research departments. You can either aggregate or disseminate that data that's available. Data analysis or data analysts. You can think deeper into your data. 
using things like graph search, both as text search, the first API and the same. And business users. Uh, you can use big data seamlessly via apps so that you have a web application where your clients, your customers, your employees will use big data without even knowing it. You can interface that uh, query or request with Drift so that that gets pushed through uh, an existing uh, web API that you have and you have big data deployed to your customers or to the highest layer of abstraction. So to wrap up, that wasn't my bad. To wrap up, we've got a key to look. It bridges the gap from a security perspective that restrict uh, large data sets in organizations and industries that require policy and quantity. And we've got a squirrel, which combines the best of available technologies, including a key to and develops their own, contributes their own, to give more of a complete solution. And defines the gaps for the big data. Here's where you can uh, look at setting up a key to uh, at the end of June, the Q, that um, was called Convention, basically what it is, there'll be an announcement from Squirrel, and we'll see hopefully a package come out. So otherwise, when we get started, you can use their uh, Amazon Key interface or image. Um, you can just spin up the new Kilo shell, you can take a look and ingest some data. That's it. So we can go back to this. Are there any questions? Can you speak a little more about the like this is JSON and how it automatically index a lot of properties or so Squirrel kind of that's part of their secret sauce that they actually can't give it to our monitors. Uh, they have a lot of government agencies and um, security agencies. So the JSON part is custom. They're they're doing that on a point by point. So how does that compare, I guess, to, because like, one nice thing about Mongo is that it automatically invents into a lot of fields with, you know, the document kind of central model. Um, we also use the HBase, but the HBase is a very low level binary data, and you have to only build your own data to help a bit and use things like plastic search to have indexes. But it sounds like the theory of this is complicated with HBase, but instead of it being complicated in the discourse, it's complicated in the simplicity. So because you're dealing with each of these columns that are being sorted uh, hierarchically, and you have the, the, the row column is going to be the most important thing. The example that was given to me was Google. So when Google deployed this, they wanted to figure out how to disseminate who was going to what site. So the row was the data they were looking for, and the amount of people were with the value, right? Well, if they were to go to the classic FPDN, and not a reverse of PDN, then they would see uh, all the A's would be first. And so you'd have uh, you know, AST doc, and you'd have index doc, and you'd have mail doc. It, it wouldn't give you relevant information, and you'd have to search with Pima, you'd have to go all the way over to finally get to that relevant bit, which would be the, the before the dot com, right? So they just searched it. And in ingest, they just did a reverse the string, and you had com dot you know, the, the FQDN and then dot and the subdomain. That allowed them to have instantaneous searches because it was complicit, all the dot coms were together. It was easy to find differentiating FQDN. Uh, that's the complexity of Cumulo, is designing the ingest, designing the key pairs, so that you have them properly architected, including the security layer, so that when you go through and submit queries on that data, you get relevant to so it would be best. Okay. Yeah. So where does the Lucene fit in as far as the... So Lucene is just... Lucene is post. Uh, so after you write a query, Squirrel just has some interface and layers that, that allows you to easily extract the uh, result um, and put it inside the scene or give you some, some graph structure. Okay. Because that's kind of what you're doing, sort of like in the database, and then we also use plastic search to... Yeah. Um, ...try to find the index of data. Yes, yeah, so you would find a, a huge increase in uh, capability. If, if, but that's the problem, is that we're taking this already built system, and HBase has a lot of market share because of that. They open source for a long time before Accumulo did. And Accumulo is deployed to NSA, CIA. Most large national government organizations use Accumulo. It's designed by them. 
So that's why I use it. But if you can devote the time in order to rebuild those systems, you will see an insane boost in performance because you don't have that ETL of those different layers that you're trying to insert and navigate. Do you not have ETL or do you have or the I mean once again get back to the the same argument that I have over and over again. All of your analyses that you perform have underlying assumptions. Some of them loose assumptions, some of them more strict assumptions. Bringing the data in and not looking at some point for whether or not the data validates those assumptions, there is no point in doing the analysis. A lot of people do make the assumptions, at least in places I've been, make the assumptions or evaluate the assumptions a lot of times at ETL. There. They have embedded in ETL checks on those assumptions. Now, once you do that, you may not have to change that very frequently. But at some place, you have, if you're going to do analysis, any analysis, you have to validate your assumption. Otherwise, you just have garbage as a result. So where are those assumptions validated in, in this system? Or is that an offline process that you have to do? So you're sort of begging the question that you still have the hard work of, of doing essentially what the ETI will do. There's something in there to do, but that's done on and maybe done periodically to check and make sure. You still have that problem. It doesn't go away. So the Camilo works best where you know who needs what data and what data is needed. And, 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 and the data has, and the data is perfectly transformed or perfectly manipulated in order to validate the underlying assumption of the analysis you're performing. So that has to be done somewhere. Correct. And those assumptions need to be obtained before moving forward with the design. I, that sounds great. So that has to be embedded somewhere in the process. Correct. Yeah. And that's, that, I'm glad you brought that up because that just helps to re-emphasize the data model perspective. That that is absolutely paramount to making this thing work efficiently. I would agree. I would, I would suspect the the the, uh, the security agencies have plenty of people who understand that, understand their underlying assumptions, and are able to have validated the data before they before they start doing. Well, it. that's that's why the place where this shines are places like healthcare data, uh, international um, uh, census data. Uh, data that is normally protected by some sort of wall, self your paywalls, uh, you know, those types of research data, those things are already set. Your values are going to be ambiguous, but the security descriptors and the searchable values, the title of the paper, whatever it might be, are going to be static. Uh, that's really where this shines. I also see it shining in places like AR and AP, though, where you have new products, uh, accounts receivable, accounts payable. Just, just the, the standard business side, you can start to look at uh, much larger data sets that you don't have to, on the back end, push through some sort of sieve. You're pushing it through the sieve on the front end, giving you a much more massive data set with much greater relevance. Why would the NSA decide to open source this technology? It's very rare. I know no so, other instance. So I don't think there was a sort of uh, but when the developers were working with the NSA, that was just one of the requests as a part of working with Louisiana Hamilton and some of the other consulting firms. So it was just a request by the developers. <laughs> Good shot. Why would the, what's the motive? Why would the developers? Oh, oh because it's a bit of applicability. Uh, the granularity of security was not there in each case. So they, they were going to open source in 2009. I have no idea what the impediment was or the, the reticence, but it, it took two, two or three years. And then the early cumulus adoption rate because of that. Follow up. Why hasn't a cumulus swirl caught on the private sector? It seems to be pretty much right. located in the, <laughs> the public sector. Well, mostly because people already have existing plans. So to go to a manager of someone who has HBase Cassandra Mongo deploy and working, they're getting results. It's in use. It's, 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 it's going. What, what motivation do you have for security? security? If you're in healthcare or finance, you can have a regulation. 
compiles for security process? Well, that's something that is the all the big players in healthcare information exchange. That's they're dealing with that on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, not only is it are you running a HIPAA compliance issue, you're running into the certain data usage issues. The ability to complete tasks and requests and queries are being problematically obfuscated by people's ability to access certain uh, certain data. I don't know if I'm wrong, but it's, this seems to be work better with structured data as opposed to unstructured data. Is that right? No, it can work great for unstructured data. I mean, you need to know what you want from that unstructured data first. Right, and then you need to clean and model it. So well, you know, you can use a cumulative clean model. You can just push through, you know, uh, text files or concatenate a bunch of texts and push it through as long as you have your labeler set up and you know explicitly the data that you're looking for. What would cause you to write a new versus just a new or unstructured data processing? Security. Security. Yeah. Because you can do the quick sorts, you can do the quick queries uh, for, for a thousand employees yeah. from, from the ground. Um, instead of having to piecemeal security solutions and get different silos to work together. Has anybody successfully hacked into a cumulative? Not um, yet. Yeah. And these are still, I mean, there are still things to, to take into account. Capital servers have to be on the common subnets. They have to have the quintessential uh, internal security in order to deploy this. But as long as your LDAP is controlled, your ABS, your IAMs, then it's pretty impenetrable. Uh, you have to have an insider, someone with keys, an evil mate. What's the downside? Exactly what Mark just said. All of the design, uh, the fact that you need to know your data infinitely before you start to process it. That's, that's the downside. The learning curve is even steeper than just the quintessential common case than SQL database. How steep? I, I would say if you understood what I just explained, then it would be as steep as looking at your data and identifying what you want as rows and what you need as, as common qualifiers and common visibility units. I mean, it's, it's really, the, it's as steep as the data is what it boils down to. So, so was this actually a work from? No, this was, uh, so, uh, I actually know one of the developers, and that was brought up when I, I talked to him about this to make sure that I wasn't misrepresenting anything. Uh, and he said that HBase was not sticking to Google's big table design. So the ability to parse records and to deal with distribution and uh, disseminating those parcels of data, HBase was trying to accommodate more of a SQL approach. And by using column families and by disseminating data in a not an ad hoc way, but a much less stringent way, you, you can't utilize binary search, you can't utilize uh, uh, tablet servers or servers in the same way. Um, the, the divergence was pretty obvious to them, and that's why they looked at using it uh, in the NSA and the security platform, but it just didn't have the muster. And that's what you're seeing today. How is the tablet server different from the region server? So the tablet server is dumb. Compared to a region server, a tablet server just looks at uh, the, the beginning part of the drive, the end of the beginning part of the drive that contains and houses the data, and then just goes in a single seek. A single seek is all the tablet server is doing. So HBase is looking at a plethora of information uh, when it does a request and gives a response. Um, it much much like its divergence from a uh, map or a reducer in map reduce. Uh, there are the most simple elements you can get. And that's what makes them the most powerful. Because they're quick, they're speed. So that's, that's the primary difference between the two. And it could be wrong. Be... Well, there may be someone on, and maybe uh, Eli knows, I don't know. I'll let you know if he uh, types anything in the chat function. What is the pricing model of school? That is uh, unknown. So unfortunately, you need to deal with their sales departments to find out. But I believe it is on a client by client basis. Which makes sense given the amount of consulting that's required to get this deployed.
Great. Any other questions? Of course, baby boomers would be nice with any moose and squirrel. <laughs> Did you see one of the prophets of the evil world when I asked him? Boris Panda. Boris and Natasha told me we to have moose and squirrels. <laughs> Alright, well, thank you very much for the time. Appreciate it. And thank you, everybody, for coming. We uh, have our uh, next month scheduled um, Ken Farmer from IBM. And uh, Tom Burbank from CA Technologies. Um, and I want to thank you all for coming. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, John. You did a fantastic job. I really learned a lot. Um, and uh, I hope to all see you again uh, next month. Thank you. Can I have one more? Yeah. So, just everybody here, and also anybody who may be uh, watching online, uh, just know what we're building out there and look at the structure as fast as we can. So, we really need to do job developers, so we need good data scientists. So if anybody needs to get up, hit me up. I'm sure you can get my contact info through my Thanks. Thank you.